Well, actually, I'll start with just a, say a word. Why do I have a disclaimer in the beginning? Because we present to investors and we're presenting information here because of that importance for us that it is quantified. So we're the first company to put quantified natural capital impacts out there, and it's a big number. So we'll get to that for later in the presentation. But that's why we have a disclaimer in the beginning, because for our, I'll say, legal and financial people, that's necessary. So who are we? Um, you've heard of our brands. You may have heard of our brands. Gucci, Puma, uh, a host of others. But basically, we are an apparel and accessories company. We focus mainly in luxury, and we have some sports brands as well. We're about $10 billion in revenue for those that are, are uh, following that part of the business side. But the point is, we, everything we make comes from raw materials, from natural capital. And we recognize that we have a dependence on that, whether it's a suit, whether it's a gold watch, whether it's uh, a leather purse. Trace it back, it comes from nature. But we, that can be said of everything in this room, for that matter. So I'm going to talk about the environmental profit and loss. As a show of hands, who here has heard of EPNL, environmental profit and loss? Maybe heard of it as Puma EPNL, maybe as Caring. Can anyone raise your hand if you've heard of it? Okay, that's not that's. It's it's interesting to see just how how many people have heard of it, and then also that tells me how much I need to maybe go into explaining what it is. So it uses a metaphor of a financial profit and loss. It's a little complicated because, you know, with, with money, it's a, it's a flow, and you have some sort of, I'll say, capital. And that's the idea here. We're talking about ecosystem services that we use. That's the flow. And we're measuring how much of that flow that we use each year. Of course, the natural capital itself is, we'll say, the reserve of what's out there. And we've seen a lot of interesting numbers today, um, particularly that Tom presented, that were about how much we're using. But what's left in the planet is still where there's a need for a lot of data. So this is a new field. And so it's not perfect by any means, but if you wait till it's perfect, it's too late. So one way to define a, a environmental profit and loss is in terms of I'll say our use of ecosystem services. For our company, um, we look at that across our supply chain because that's basically we, we make things that we sell to people. In another way of looking at it, it's looking at the environmental footprint of everything you do, the value of those impacts, and that creates an EPNL. But I'll go, I'll try to peel back the layers underneath that. So for us, for instance, um, we did this work across our business. So we had to understand exactly what is our business. And although that may be a, a surprise to a lot of people that don't work in industry, most businesses don't really understand what they do. They understand the end product they sell. Maybe they understand a little bit about their consumer. Sometimes they don't understand all the things that go into it. More and more companies have to understand this. But does this company understand what goes to making a plastic bottle? Probably the spring water company just buys the bottle. Where it comes from, how it's made, the processes, where the petroleum is sourced, who knows? So that's a similar challenge that many companies face. So for us, we do a lot of work to understand our business deeper in terms of what processes do we do. We looked at over 600 processes. We looked at over 100 key materials. 5,000 suppliers in, in our group, the suppliers that we don't own, but going beyond our boundary to who sells us, who, who produces the leather, who raises a cow, which is much, much harder, by the way, to answer that question. So there's some, some things that we do need a lot of data on, but the point is we started that journey by peeling back, I'll say, the layers of the onion of our supply chain to understand it and to understand how we make things and where they come from. And if there's one point to make on that traceability, which came up in the prior session, is really, really important because you can't do any of this work on natural capital, whether it's 
you're looking at a mining operation in the Philippines, whether you're looking at an island in the Pacific, it is very place-based. So you have to know where the impacts are occurring. So in any case, we looked at our supply chain, we detailed it, um, we not only documented but also surveyed our suppliers to gather their information from them about their environmental footprint. At the same time, we're looking at that across six key indicators to come to a, a question that uh, arose before. So that's water use, water pollution, air pollution, greenhouse gas, land use, which incorporates biodiversity, which I will touch on again, and waste. And within those, we have several sub-indicators depending on, on which one. The only one that does not have any sub-indicators is greenhouse gas, or because that sort of speaks for itself. So with that, and this gets to the complicated part, if that isn't complicated enough, we use, I'll say, the best available information we have on valuation coefficients. So that's a whole study in environmental economics. There could probably be a two-week seminar on that. We're not going to do that today. But what we are going to say is we're not, we don't have environmental economists at Caring. We make clothes and purses and shoes, so, and watches for that matter. So what we do do is try to get the best information out there and apply that in the context that makes sense for us. We'll also be announcing more about what we're open sourcing in terms of that data in about a week. We'll have a Twitter live chat on that. Um, so I will add on to Twitter stream later to give information about that. But our plan is to open source everything we're doing that we can. So in the end, what do we end up with? We end up with environmental profit and loss. It's dated in euro values, also in the volume. So we talk about how many millions of liters of water, but we also talk about the value of those. And that value is driven by where the water comes from, for instance. And I will go into a deeper example on water. We break it down for our business by business units, by materials, by brand, location, any way we can to inform a real decision because that's where we actually have an impact, is when we have a buyer that's looking to source sheep leather and we can tell them where a better place is. Of course, quality is going to predominate, but to get a high quality leather, there's only certain parts of the world that can provide that. And we want to find the parts that we know it's going to be a sustainable supply. So in a business context and an environmental context, it's the same goal. So just to say, within the EPNL, within any particular impact, we capture, I'll say, the volumetric impact of those six elements across water, water pollution, air pollution, greenhouse gas, land use and waste, and then we apply evaluation coefficient. So in a sense, it's simple algebra. It's just a lot of data. How much data is over two million data points, in fact. So that's why data does matter, and also why automation matters. And that, using the weather example, weather is another example where technology has helped to a lot more understand climate change scenarios, climate change risk, but you have to have not only the data, but the ability to use that data and then apply it to real situations. So just to say a little bit about valuation, um, we're using welfare economics as a basis for it. I'm not an environmental uh, economist, but I can explain a little bit about it. You really, we're looking at the impacts on, it's really, in a sense, the impacts on society. Although the EPNL metaphor is, if you wrote a check to nature for what you use, how much would that check be for? In fact, the way to, as a proxy, we need to use societal costs. And an easier one would be something like air pollution, where you can have quanti quantitative things like respiratory disease, health issues, agricultural losses, reduced visibility. You can have um, asphyxiation of rivers and the impact on, on um, in that sense, on fisheries. What's more difficult for us is when we get into topics like land use, where we try to get broader um, impacts, such as cultural values, such as biodiversity. 
and that well, I'll talk about some work we're doing on that further. This is primarily the assumptions behind this are based on a study that was referenced earlier, the TEAB study, um, which is, I'll say, generally accepted on, on how one goes about this. But that's a field that's also rapidly advancing. Natural capital protocol is also helping move that forward as well. So a bit about us. What did we discover when we did our, our Group B p &L? And we're actually ready to publish another one in, as I said, next week. So. But the big discoveries were most of our impact is in what we looked at the least historically, which is, I'll, I'll say, our Tier 4. So to explain this, Tier 4, which is to the right-hand side, is the raw material production. That's what's coming out of natural capital reserves. Tier 3 is converting that into something, like leather, uh, like fabrics, Tier two is further processing. You might do dyeing, you might do other finishing on it. Tier one is assembly where you're putting it together. And tier zero is really then getting it to you. That can be through distribution, that's our stores, that's our offices. Only 7% of our impact is in tier zero. And this is what's legally mandated in most reporting schemes. Um, certainly we're, we have one in France, also for other um, like carbon disclosure and other exercises, generally you look at what's in your legal boundaries. And in our case, um, most of that is in tier zero. And then when we look at tier four, 50% of our impacts are in tier four. So that was a, um, an awakening moment and also something for us to, to help bolster the focus on where do we source our raw materials and tracing that supply. So there's a lot of work depending on the industry in doing that, but that's sort of where it all comes together, is understanding where things come from. And that's really what Tier 4 is about. And then how they're made, which is Tier, tier, tier 3. How do you do, whether it's leather tanning, whether it's uh, metal refining, um, whether it's spinning, weaving, dyeing. The processes matter because there's different impacts, one depending on where they are, and, and two depending on how they're done. In the end, we ended up with 773 million of loss using the EP&L um, uh, accounting metaphor. That's why I said a disclaimer in the beginning, that's a big number for most companies. And for, I think, when we look at other industries, as we indicated below, it could be a substantial part of their profits. So what's this also give us, and I'll give a water example, um, it gives us a way also to look at where is our big, where's our big footprint. So this compares the material quantity on the bottom that we use compared to the impact of the raw material. So this is again looking at what I call tier four. So here I'll focus on uh, plant fibers. And zooming in on those, I'll use an example with cotton, because that's one of the more significant ones and probably a little easier to explain. And you can see that there's some big drivers here. There's two key drivers. One, when you look at cotton from India versus cotton from Turkey, there's a big difference driven by water in terms of the environmental impacts. But also a big lever is whether it's organic and rain-fed or whether you're using irrigation. So both can make a big difference, but the biggest driver is organic versus conventional. But this is also to say where matters. Then we talk a little bit about the methodology. Another example is cashmere. And that's something where you see very price impacts on cashmere. And you also see it's a very, very intense material. Why is it so intense? Because to get cashmere, you need to comb the hair of a goat and basically get those fibers off the comb and that's how the, it takes a lot of fibers to make a sweater. And those goats need a lot of land. And what happened in Mongolia and northern China is that land and the grazing caused a lot of dust and desertification, which also impacted um, cities in China and eastern China in terms of air pollution. So there was a real impact from that, which also um, Interestingly enough, silk has been impacted by air pollution, so there's a tie between, believe it or not, cashmere grazing and silk production. 
So as a result, the government restricted grazing and the price went up. So there's a clear thing where sustainable practices or lack thereof can have a direct impact on materials that we use. So one thing we're looking at besides sustainable grazing practices for cashmere is, okay, how do we look ahead? In the interest of time, because it's running out, how do we take climate change scenarios and also apply those to our work in EPNL? So that's one of the frontiers we're looking at right now is applying that kind of data for forward looking. Because one thing you say, oh, this is what my impacts are today. What about tomorrow? What's it gonna mean for sourcing um, sheep from Tunisia? I don't know. Uh, we can pick any country. Climate change obviously is having effects. We have predictive models on it. We need to start thinking ahead of, in terms of what are sustainable sources, not only to choose wisely, but to preserve as well. I'll say one more note on biodiversity before we go to questions. It's another area we're working on because there's a lot of questions around how do we better account for biodiversity. And land use does take that into account through the ecosystem services that are degraded. But there's, I'll say, a, a heated debate whether that's sufficient or not, or whether there's other, um, other measures that, that should be taken into account. So that's one of the things we're working on with a natural capital project to undertake that study um, with leading scientists and economists to better understand, are we measuring that impact correctly? Do we need to add to that? Do we need to measure it differently? Um, basically, what is the, the right mechanism? But the point is for us is we have to jump in. So as I said, we're, one of the, we're the first company to publish our results like this to do this kind of transparency on not only our methodology, but also on how we do business and what impacts that have. And it may not be perfect information, but sometimes it takes, uh, what do I say, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. So one of our key goals by driving more transparency, whether it's open sourcing, whether it's sharing our results, is to encourage other companies, governments, um, organizations to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have 